Sorry, dropped it. Hello, Stonehenge! Stonehenge, where the demons dwell, where the banshees live and they do live well. Stonehenge, where a man's a man and the children dance to the pipes of Pan. Who takes the Pandora car? Takes the universe! Now the question of the hour is, who's got the Pandora car? Answer, I do. Next question, who's coming to take it from? No plan, no backup, no weapons worth a damn. Oh, and something else I don't have. Anything to lose. So, if you're sitting up there in your silly little spaceship with all your silly little guns, and you've got any plans on taking the Pandora car tonight, just remember who's standing in your way. Remember, every black day I stopped you and then and then do the smart thing let somebody else try first and oh how they danced the little children of stone age beneath the haunted moon for fear that daybreak I come too soon. Scanning for audio. Welcome to another Tin Dog Podcast. Yes, it's a two-part story, and normally I review them all in one go. But it's Saturday the 26th, and the Big Bang starts in less than three hours' time. So what I thought I'd do is I'd talk about part one before we watch part two. And part one really seems to be Home of the Questions. A tremendously well-made story that just has, well, that sort of Damocles of part two couldn't possibly be as good as part one. And so... While I'm still feeling particularly positive about this story, I thought I'd talk about it now. What a fantastic opening sequence. Yes, I'm not quite sure what River Song's doing at that particular moment in history, and also what she's in jail for. Is it the same crime she committed earlier, or later? Or is indeed the person that she kills who's the best person around happen in this coming story? This whole story is basically home of questions. But perhaps we're just reading too much into it and asking ourselves too many things, trying in vain to figure out what's going to happen tonight. Questions like, was Rory always an Auton? Or, was the original Rory kept alive by the Autons in order to make the duplicate? Does this mean that Amy has a plastic pal who's fun to be with? Did they have a variety of Autons who they changed as he grew up? Because apparently they grew up together. Is this a new type of Auton we've not seen? Or is he similar to the one in the original story who ran the business? Yes, Autons who believe they're human aren't exactly a new thing. Big Finish covered this wonderfully in Brave New Town. But that's just one of the questions that we just don't know the answer to and we may never know the answers. How was Rory saved from time? His memories? Or were they stored in some sort of time-proof vault within the nesting consciousness? You see, like many Doctor Who stories, I want to talk about the end. Not the beginning, not that fabulous little montage sequence at the beginning, or even that intercut moment when the horse is running towards Stonehenge. Oh, and I hope you don't mind me using that bit from Spinal Tap at the beginning of this. I just couldn't help myself. Yes, it's all very Indiana Jones, but you just can't help yourself when you've got a story that's got River Song in it. And yes, as has been happening for quite a large amount of this series, Amy's just been, well... 
secondary to the whole storyline. She's just not been that required, apart from that whole business with the whole thing being set up. I thought that whispering voice, Silence Will Fall, was just that megalomaniac head Dalek. But perhaps you'll find out it's someone else. Who is piloting the TARDIS? All of these things are important to us. And I'm sure we'll find out. But they've been burning holes in us for a week. We know that the Doctor will survive. We know that there's a Christmas special. We know, or at least we think we know, that the actress who plays Amy is signed up to be in it next year. We know that the Vortex Manipulator was at the Doctor's feet when he was picked up, so it could be in his pocket. I'd be surprised if he could escape the Pandoric box using that. The only thing that I am sure about is that the writers, I'm sure, will have come up with something even better than I could have imagined. Yes, of course there are some bits I had issues with. The Cyberman wandering around, he had a skull inside? Since when did that happen? Well, actually, I think it happened last time, and they weren't Cybermen, they were Cybusmen. Cybermen from the alternate dimension. But that was explained by them saying, all parallels will fold and die. Silence will fall across the board, just like all the stars going out at the end of the last Dalek story. They've painted themselves into a corner, really. Each series has to finish with the universe being in peril. You can only put the universe in peril so much before it becomes a little bit boring. See Buffy's series 1 to 7 for more information. There was a question I needed to ask about the Cybersmen. If the suit can operate without the biological component, why bother with the biological component at all? Just let them become logical robots. I'm sure they'll have a perfectly good time just being robots. And as for the location of our Cybermen, well, in Silver Nemesis it's the last of the Cybermen. They're being defeated. Let's imagine that they were defeated and they are no more. A perfectly reasonable thing to believe. I, for one, of course, don't believe that, and wish that our Cybermen would turn up and at least try and take over the Cybermen for a new design, using their spare parts and classic Cyberman technology for a whole new cyber race, thus allowing the people who make those lovely toys to make yet another killing with yet another design. Yes, we are Doctor Who fans. We have bottomless pockets. You know all of those lovely aliens that turned up, many of whom really shouldn't have been there at all? I mean, the Draconians, what did they have against the Doctor? I don't really think that's an option. And I know in Doctor Who magazine there was talk of using some classic monsters in the background, but if they decided to bring those classic monsters back next year and they hadn't redesigned them, then there would be hell to pay. It's a shame, but I can see their point. Mind you, though, I don't know why the Silurians, or indeed how the Silurians, were there as part of the giant coalition. And what's it with this giant coalition? It really did feel, to me, like the original Batman movie. The one from 1966, is it? The one where all the supervillains gang up to create a ludicrously complicated plot to take out the Batman? What's all that about? These people do not get along. Can you imagine the meeting? So as long as you put your brain in neutral, didn't think about it far too much, as you know we do, then this was one of the greatest Doctor Who's ever. And if you think about it too much, well, it was still pretty damn good. And so, bring on the man in the box. I'm sure things will be alright, because in less than three hours' time... We found out exactly what happens, and hopefully we'll get an answer to at least some of these questions. I'm sure I forgot to talk about something, but I'll talk about that when I talk about part two in less than a second's time. I detect another mine. Mm -hmm. And they eventually manage to get to Stonehenge, and und they go underneath to... And I'm going to take this, I crib this directly from Michael from the Tin Dog podcast, quite frankly. He sent me a text saying this, and it made me laugh my socks off. They go to the underhenge, which sounds like a piece of Victorian corsetry. Um, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> women's underwear, um, yeah, some of it it's, is torturous. So, it's uh, a case of, it's the underhenge. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Oh, like actually, Michael. you've totally ruined that now <laughs> for me. <laughs> the other mind has now left the Matrix. The Pandora cut is opening. What is it? Box, cage, a prison. It was built to contain the most feared thing in all the universe. Anything that powerful I'd know about it. Why don't I know? Everything that ever hated you is coming here tonight. They're all here, all of them, all for you. What could you possibly be? If something can be remembered, it can come back. Hello, Amy. But you died. How can you be here? What's your name? Rory. How could she not remember me? Because you never existed. Who are those Romans? They're not real. They can't be. They're all in a book in Amy's house. It's a trap. It has to be. Plastic Romans. 
duplicates. Listen to me. You have to run. I'm a thing. I'll kill you. Just go! There's something wrong with the TARDIS. Something else is controlling it. 26th of June, 2010. A scenario was devised from the memories of your companion. Rory Williams from Ledworth. My boyfriend. How could I ever forget you? The cracks in time are the work of the Doctor. The Pandorica is ready! Ready for what? Ready for you! Every sun will supernova at every moment in history. The whole universe will never have existed. Listen to me! And so Saturday ends. The Big Bang comes and goes. And there's nothing left to do except play the Doctor Who Adventures online. And, of course, wait 180 odd days till Christmas. Now, I'm probably going to get beaten up for this by some people, but I just didn't like this story as much as I hoped I would. But this is what happens at the end of a series. Part 12 is simply marvellous. It promises so much. So much that it possibly can't deliver. The momentum has to change between parts 1 and part 2. And there were so many questions raised by this series that I began to have my doubts early on that we wouldn't get answers to everything. And boy oh boy was I proved right. From the very beginning, Moffat obeyed the rules of writing. Give the audience what they're expecting, just not exactly how they're expecting it. Yes, when the Pandoric opens, it's a surprise to everyone that Amy's inside. And it's at that point that things start to go a little bit skewy. We've established that the sonic screwdrivers, when they touch are in the same timeline and there's a spark there could have been at least a tiny bit of a spark between Amy and Amelia. Lovely little touches like there being no stars and a rewritten 11th hour worked really well. Evidence of course that they were shot at the same time because little girls do grow up very very quickly so episode 13 and episode 1 all part of the same block nice touch. Again with that beginning sequence the psychologist the absence of stars the Dalek, I wasn't quite sure what it was doing in the museum. And you know, even under three inches of crap, the Daleks still look like crap. I'm sorry, I just don't like them. I don't think I ever will. I'm beginning to learn to accept them, but that's as far as I'm willing to go. So we're going to ignore the Blinovich limitation effect, because that's all old school. And to be honest, they could probably make up some sort of excuse about it being a tiny universe anyway with just the one world. Yes, supposedly, time and space are all messed up, so that things are in the wrong place, like Penguins of the Nile. Except I didn't realise this until I was watching The Confidential. I'm not fond of having to watch The Confidential in order to understand things that I assume are just a mistake. Perhaps it's my museumness that goes against all of this. Yes, it's got some great quotable lines. It's got some lovely moments. Rory hanging around for 2,000 years. This is plastic Rory. So in this universe, the chances of him hanging around with, well, Torchwood are quite high. But of course, all that gets rewritten at the end, when we returned to the possibility of real Rory. Whether he was plastic or not all along, I just don't know. Stroke care anymore. Like I said, it's very good in parts. The business with the fez. I did have issues at the time while watching, with the Bill and Ted escaping from the Pandoric style escape. But I can live with that. I can. Just. I'm not fond of the Doctor hopping to and fro with time travel especially using some sort of handheld device stolen from Captain Jack's mates. No, it just didn't feel like Doctor Who. Yes, he was wearing a fez. Yes, you could do a whole Tommy Cooper impression. I was waiting for him to go. Not like that, like that, or whatever. But that didn't happen, thank God. Yes, you can rescue River, and I'm glad she's here. I really am. The fact that she keeps surviving all of these events and she's living life backwards does mean that, like the Doctor, she will survive every story she's in because we've already seen her die, which means every story that she's in, the Jeopardy is knocked back a notch, just a tiny bit. But that Jeopardy is replaced by Mystery, who is she, what's she doing? I know last week we had lines like, I never let you out, lines like, I shouldn't let you out, implying that she was his wife or mother. The Doctor's theory that it's his wife just led to another deep apology, where she started impersonating Tennant again. Now, the thing I had real issue with was the kick-starting of the entire universe. Because while I was watching it the first time, I did get the feeling that the whole universe was being extrapolated from, well, her memories. She never met everyone in the universe. So how's that going to work? 
the whole universe is gone and it just felt literally like the world's biggest reset button and not just that it also felt very much like the end of well the last full season of tenant the daleks are putting out the stars at the end of this previous part the world's was the only thing that survived when the stars went out it's more of the same and because it's such a big universe is in jeopardy kind of thing we end up in exactly the same place there's no way out except for a reset button and of course just like father's day the companion saves the day once again time moves on through the story and my attention begins to wander just a bit because it's well got no major monsters i did get the feeling that the whole story was written and they had to shoehorn the dalek in just to give some sort of threat getting back to the original opening sequence am i the only person who shouted pick up that penguin when amelia knocked it over i don't know so yes this whole season has been about mythology about the myth about fairy stories and the tear of amy falling on the doctor's lovely blue book and bringing him back from the dead well that just belonged in a fairy story for me it crossed over from sci-fi to well the thing that everyone's been seeing doctor who's been for a while but last week had so much promise it had too much promise there's no way it could have lived up to it in seeing that it wasn't disappointing i did have a week of excitement like i was when i was a kid in between stories the cliffhangers are very good how are they going to get out of that oh yeah using some sort of handheld time machine device that kept appearing in the first part i know i get it the business with all of the people around the pandorica being reduced to dust well that just confused matters even more i still don't know what half of them were doing there how the Silurians got there is beyond me unless of course they were the aforementioned draconians as per my theory in that review there are far too many questions still raised by this why is living in a house by yourself a very big house a bad thing amy's crack has a lot to answer for and of course we still never found out the big question is who is behind the silence and who was piloting the tardis i'm sure we'll find out at some point i think personally that this means the next river song story might not necessarily take place before this one it may take place after because then she would know who was behind it and i wish people would stop saying timey wimey because i get this sort of thing but it still makes little sense next time i'll be talking about the dominators the second doctor story that isn't half as loved as it should be so until then i'll leave you with matt smith on stage with orbital at glastonbury be seeing you yes glastonbury Orbital, orbital, how oh, you do the theme tune with the Cool. Actually, our screen's gone a bit wibbly. Cool, have some glasses for you. <laughs> wibbly, wobbly, tiny, right me. Yeah, there we go. Good. Come on, work. So, Glastonbury, this is the last song of the evening, people. If you're a loss, this, this won't count. For Orbital, they're back.
have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. It's a fez. I wear a fez now. Fezes are cool. Oh! Right, I've just received a text message from Michael at the Tin Dog Podcast, which is quite brilliant, actually. Um, let's have a look. Uh, right, I'll be ostracised for this, but I wasn't that taken with Big Bang 2. You didn't like it. Uh, it went from Bill and Ted-style antics to incomprehensible reset button with ultra speed. Yes, it was clever and enjoyable. River shone through, Matt was superb, but I still don't know when Auton Rory replaced real Rory, or even if there was a real or even if there was a real Rory. Apparently living in a big house is odd, eh? Uh, glad that it's Rory and Amy for next year, and sad we don't know who made the TARDIS grow screwy or what's behind the silence. Michael. Now, do you know that's echoing well, well. exactly what, te- what uh, Trev was saying? So fair enough. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is. But what I, do, I mean, Michael, this is lazy podcasting in the extreme. Get your recorder <laughs> out, stick it out on your own superb feed rather than using the DWP as your voice piece, please. But having said that, it sounds like that uh, that you and Trev are in agreement. It's just a shame that Trevor stepped out of the camper van quickly. <laughs> but Rory himself is actually a lump of plastic now. The other mind has now left the Matrix.